God created the world, but the Dutch created the Netherlands. Despite being a bit cliché, there is actually a lot of truth to this sentence. Over 30% of the Netherlands lie below the sea level and are comprised of polders, pieces of land that were diked in and pumped out artificially. But can we humans hold on to all this new land? Or will nature take back what was originally hers? As most of you will have learned in preschool, water tends to always flow downhill. This is also the case in the Netherlands, which is why polders, that can lay multiple meters below the sea level, will fill up with rainwater eventually, if nothing is being done to prevent this. In the beginning, this prevention was quite easy. People would just open up locks on low tide, which would let water flow out towards the sea. Over time though, people started building polders in lower and lower regions, which made this approach impossible. On top of that, the decomposition of organic matter causes land to subside, because of which even polders that were originally above the low tide water level ended up below it. These processes will keep going for centuries to come and have already made it necessary to install more and more complex pumping systems. Originally, the pumping was done with windmills, but these were later replaced with steam pumps, diesel pumps, and nowadays mostly electric pumps. While electric pumps can generally operate much more reliably than some of the predecessors, they don't need the wind to blow in order to work, and have much less moving parts than a steam pump, for example, there's still one big threat looming over them. Power outages. So, with me living in a pretty low region of the Netherlands myself, and my dad, who works at a large energy grid operator, having warned me about the possibilities of looming power outages many a times, I thought, hey, it might be nice to find out a little more about this. While some googling revealed that there's apparently people who would simply like to flood the Netherlands and offer swimming lessons to people who live in cities, I thought there's gotta be a better solution. So I got to work, writing emails to some of the Dutch water management associations, the so-called water boards. And what would you know? I actually got some replies. Disclaimer, these are actually just random papers. I do not own a printer so I couldn't print out the replies. Please don't sue me. And as it turns out, the water boards have been thinking about exactly this problem too. And quite a lot for that matter. Local power outages can already cause some issues, but widespread outages pose a much bigger threat. You see, water management systems within polders are actually divided into two subsections. For one, rainwater gets collected in smaller channels that run throughout the polder. This water is then pumped into larger, higher collection channels called... Boozum? Um, th that's not it. Boozum. Ah. Uh, yeah. Well, these channels are much bigger, and there are just a few pumping stations within the area of each waterboard that pump water out from them. You can actually see this difference between small and large channels really well in this illustration that was helpfully provided by the Hoogheimraadschap Hoogheimraad Hoogheimra Hoog <laughs> Hoogheimra Delftland. If only some of these pumping stations fail due to a local power outage, the other ones can take over the excess water. But if all pumps are affected by the outage, this becomes much more difficult. And while a large-scale power outage may not exactly be an everyday occurrence, several studies have concluded at this point that our reliance on renewable energy resources will increase the risk of one occurring in the future. This is because both wind and solar are much more unpredictable than conventional power sources, at least until we learn how to properly manage and store the energy they produce. Besides, heavy rain events are likely to become much more common in the future due to climate change. This will also put a lot more pressure on the pumping stations, and because of that, it may no longer be possible to rely on just some of the stations to pump out all the water if there's a failure. Now, as I see it, there are generally three types of measures that water boards tend to take to deal with these issues. Firstly, they try to make power outages less likely in the first place. This can be done by connecting pumps to multiple power lines that come from different sources, so they are much less likely to both go down at the same time. 
However, if they do end up going down at the same time, there are often backup systems in place. Larger pumps may be connected to an emergency generator that can keep them up and running for a while. Smaller pumps within the polders can often be substituted by so-called tractor pumps that, as the name implies, are mobile and can use a tractor engine as a power source. And finally, there's some efforts in order to intelligently manage the water levels within the channels based on weather forecasts. For example, by pumping out some of the water from the channels before heavy rain is anticipated, or by letting water go slightly above the normal levels in cases of failures. So... what can we learn from all of this? Honestly, my main takeaway from making this video is that the effects of power outages are very complex. Not only can they have different regional extents, but also vary massively in length. Depending on what kind of power outage we're dealing with, different measures may be necessary. While waterboards already have sophisticated models and action plans in place in order to deal with these kinds of situations, there are still things we could do to deal with all these various possibilities for types of crises. For one, it may be necessary to increase the holding capacity of the channels within the water system. This would increase the flexibility of the entire system when dealing with strong rain or droughts and alleviate some of the stress the pumps experience. Of course, more land would be needed, which doesn't usually go down well with landowners and also stands in competition somewhat with other goals of the waterboards, such as enabling better fish migration. The holding capacity can also be increased by storing some water in the low regions themselves. For example, by adding blue roofs which store water on top of buildings, rain gardens that store it on street level, or simply water barrels to catch rainwater from houses and roads and store it for later release until the heavy rain is over. This is already partially done in many cities, but is much more difficult to implement in rural areas. And of course, the most effective way to prevent failures of pumping stations is to make power outages less likely in the first place. This could include all kinds of measures, from building more renewable energy capacity to implementing smart grids or better interconnects throughout Europe. Essentially everything that would help stabilize the electric grid. All those things are a topic for another time though. So in general, I think this is good news. With enough political commitment, all of these challenges seem to be very solvable. And I think we may just be able to hold off on sending people swimming for now.